Hey everyone, and welcome to The Private Podcast, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek E. Silva. Today, joining me on The Private Podcast is Max Howell, a former senior Xcode developer at Apple and current CEO of T.XYZ, the new foundation for today's developer stack. T is an open source solution building a new framework for the internet where projects continue continue to grow and flourish. Using blockchain technology, T allows developers to see actual returns on their efforts through a staking model. And now over to the conversation with Max Howell. All right, like I said off the top, we have Max Howell here, uh, co-founder of T. Max, thanks a lot for your time today. We really appreciate it. Glad to be here, thank you. Good stuff. Um, I'm sure some people listening to this know your at least a little bit of a story or, or who you are, but if you could give us a little bit about your background and your journey into tech to give a, get us started for anybody who's uninitiated, that'd be really great. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I never wanted to be a programmer. Uh, it was a hobby <laughs> that my, uh, my dad taught me when okay. I was six. It was, uh, one of his ways of, uh, bonding with me to teach me things that he thought were fun. Um, I found it a lot more fun than he did and ended up like writing a bunch of toys and games and like, I just kept doing that throughout my, you know, childhood and teenage years. Uh, the idea of doing it as a career, like didn't really even occur to me. Um, I remember when I went to a careers fair, uh, about 17 years old, I noticed a couple of developers sitting at a table. So I went over and talked to them. And I came away thinking they were the geekiest people I'd ever met and there was no way I wanted to be anything like them. Um, so I did a chemistry degree because I seemingly was good at the sciences and uh, I thought I wanted to be a scientist. And I did well at it, but then when I went into the industry to do chemistry for a career, uh, I discovered that, in fact, it was boring. Really, thoroughly, unbelievably boring. I realised that I'd yeah. be working on this one machine that I was working at, t measuring the surface tension of surfactants that were being produced in a neighboring lab. And I would be doing that for like the next 10 years. And that, that was my career trajectory. And then like, maybe I'd become like a manager of wow. like that department. And uh, I fell into a depression because I, you know, I'd always wanted to do something with my life. Um, stopped going to work, uh, didn't get fired because it's the UK and they, they can't follow you <laughs> half the time. Um, and installed Linux and got into open source. Uh, it was like the savior for my men mental stability. Uh, not, not good for- What time period are we talking here? This was 2003, four. Okay, yeah. And I got into working on apps for one of the desktop environments on Linux called KDE. And I found like this small little group of people who were making a music player called Amarok and I started working on that with them and like that got me nice. hooked uh the way that you know people from around the world didn't know what they looked like didn't know anything about them apart from like how they wrote code and uh we would collaborate at different times of the day and then we'd make something and like it was pretty good for a Linux app <laughs> it was very good for a Linux app <laughs> um I remember Amarok it was good oh you do yeah it was, uh, it was, innovative. oh yeah, I'll, I'll get to my, I liked it. Yeah. So yeah, that got me into doing it. Like, so I was basically doing it full time with, um, savings from the job that I had and working at my parents' house until my parents kicked me out of the house, telling me to go get a job. And so I managed to blag my way into a job at Last Fem in London, which is this music startup. Uh, they were fans of Amarok and they had some apps. So uh, it didn't matter that I didn't have computer science, etc. I proved myself with this app, and like that was the start of my career in tech, anyway. And that was about two thousand seven. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's your your uh, dive into Linux. There is right around the same time uh, I, you know, discovered it and and really started using it heavily, which was, I guess, two thousand probably two thousand two. Um, my kit, my second year of college, I had a really good Linux t-shirt named Mike Costa who yeah. liked to make jokes about write permissions and he said the <laughs> word write a lot. So yeah, 
in the Man. middle of a sentence, he's he's talking about he's talking about file permissions. He goes, "It's the right, right, right," <laughs> and all of us are just like, "What? What just happened?" And like you know, once you thought about it, you're like, "Oh, it's the right, right as in permission," and then you know, right, like you get it, yeah, and yeah. like, yeah. So that was <laughs> that, <laughs> that all threw us for a loop. That but... kind of humor, you know. <laughs> Honestly development isn't as fun as it used to be because we don't make these geeky jokes like that <laughs> right it's just it's not i'm sure the chemists the you worked with weren't geeky at all too <laughs> uh, no they were kind of like normal it's like yeah like despite the fact that i was really? turned off by the developers i met because they were so geeky but that was because i was a teenager right well like, i wasn't like i wasn't right. myself yet i wasn't like willing to accept that this was a part of me actually <laughs> Uh, so, you know, nowadays, like, there's a lot more people in tech who, uh, you know, they're cool. And, like, that's good for getting everybody else involved. Yeah. But it certainly used to be a lot more geeky, I think. <laughs> I, I still know some pretty hardcore geeks who are, who are <laughs> software developers. Most of most of them are back-end developers, of course. But um, uh, with some front, some really geeky front-end uh, front developers as well. So, well, part um, of the reason that... yeah. I'm saying this is because like lately because I've been working on T and going back and building like all these fundamental open source packages that you know are beneath like everything else the stuff that you don't normally see or hear about anymore and uh you, you go to their web pages and these things are straight out of the 90s and uh <laughs> they haven't really been touched you know the old like barely anything there aesthetic full of like geek jokes I found this because one the they're back-end developers. Yeah. <laughs> they don't care what the front end looks like, and and I think that's fine personally. But sorry, go ahead. No, well, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I loved it. In fact, seeing it again, it was it just it was a bit of nostalgia, really. For like, things have moved on since that time period. Like, there's this one that I found, and like, it had this. Uh, it was like a, a multi-layered joke about the moon landings being fake. But you could tell the person didn't actually think it was fake. It was like a trap for people who do think it's fake. And like, uh, you know, it's right. just, you don't see that kind of humor anymore, but it's very like anchored in like the origins of open source and the origins of Unix. Like the people who are building these fundamental pieces of software that we now all take for granted and use on a day-to-day -day basis without even realizing it half the time they they were like nerds in a basement and they uh enjoyed the fact that each other like could like do all these little hacky things like breaking the phone system so they can make free calls and uh yeah yep anyway it's a bit of an aside no that's okay this this the show is is full of asides that's that's no problem uh, speaking of speaking of which, I wanted to ask. So when you you know you, you said your dad taught you how to program, and then you started making all these little you know widgets and apps and things like that. Do you have a favorite from back then that you're like mm. like you're really proud of, or like this was the stupidest thing ever, but I loved it, and, and <laughs> you know, I don't really have a good reason for why I loved it. Let's see. Well, um, when I was maybe twelve, thirteen, I used to go to the library every lunchtime with. The, uh, the other guys who enjoyed programming and we kind of competed for who could like make the coolest stuff and uh, I don't know we were all pretty different in many ways but uh, me and this other guy were trying to make a video game and uh, this was like way before like the internet <laughs> really so you know in order to figure out how to Pro, we use these computers called BBC Basics. Um, I don't know, maybe Canada had those, but the UK had loads of them, and every school had like a fleet of them. Uh, branded by the BBC. Most people here. Had... Sorry, go ahead. All right, we think there's a little bit of a delay as I'm. I'm definitely not trying to interrupt. You. <laughs> yeah, well, we're all used to it nowadays. Uh, video calling is our lives. I don't know what the strategy is for interrupting people anymore. It's just like everyone tries at once. Um, so there was fleets of these BBC Mac, uh, micros and they, uh, I think they were just branded BBC. I don't know if the BBC actually had anything to do with it. Uh, I'm not really sure, but they booted into a basic prompt. So you straight away, you were into a programming language 
um, which, you know, I, I feel was why there were so many programmers from that era from the UK, honestly. And like any other country that had a similar sort of, you know, the, the main computer booted to a programming language. I, I'm sure if you looked at the stats, probably has this like surplus of developers. Um, so yeah, we, we go in there and we try to like program these games, but all we had was the manual because there was no internet, there was no stack overflow, there was there was nothing. Right. So I take the manual home and I'd like scour it looking for anything that would like try and get me towards what I was trying to do, which essentially was like keyboard input without blocking, rendering pixels to the screen. And like we start off just by rendering, you know, ASCII art to the screen, like, cause that was fine. And like the process yeah. was great, really it was, so rewarding and so truly frustrating but because like, i had this you know competition with like the other people who were trying to do it like it made it so that i persevered and managed and like i was the first guy to get a game running and i was like look i got it and it was like this little a that went across the screen and you had to dodge asteroids <laughs> but it was great and then uh we had tried to make the screen scroll and it took us ages to figure out how to make the screen scroll and in the end like we figured out that you know you can just like print the whole screen like every 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 time a for loop goes around you know we figured out how to do animation essentially from the basics because like this manual did not have anything about how to do games or anything like that it was just like this these are the functions in bbc basic <laughs> in alphabetical order and that's that with you know some <laughs> extra information nice like uh, i remember like when i finally discovered arrays because <laughs> like I've been doing it with like multiple variables like a one, a two, a three, like for ages. Oh so, yeah, like, yeah. No, I d right. there was no one to tell me what an array was or why you would use it. And we had to figure it out like piece by piece. So yeah, that was pretty remarkable. Like, you you wouldn't be able to do that nowadays with someone that age, for sure. Yeah. Like the other things I'm proud of, uh, I, like the first app I made for KDE was called FileLine, and it was like. Uh, a daisy uh, disk um, store uh, storage space analyzer you know the nested pie charts oh, nice. and uh, I'd seen something like that once and I really needed it because like back then you had like a three gigabyte hard drive and like <laughs> you know, continuously running out of disk space and uh, you <laughs> need to know where it was so like, I've always been this person who builds the stuff that I need like homebrew is very much I built it because I needed it the same. Um, I'm, I'm proud of Amarok and later than that, um, I worked at TweetDeck uh, for a couple of years and I made that Android app. And like at the time it was a pretty oh, cool. excellent app. So I'm proud of that too. You should be. I remember the, the TweetDeck, uh, I guess it was the Air client, right? I used the Adobe Air uh, on, on oh, that desktop, was the desktop. Use the Adobe yeah. Air framework. Yeah, yeah. On Android, and then, it was native. Um, and then I, yeah, I think I used the 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 Android app for a little while too um, before Twitter bought it and deprecated a lot of, of that. It. I still use it on the web though because it still yeah. it still works there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, for now it still least. still exists in some capacity. But yeah, I was really annoyed when Twitter bought it and then got rid of the the app because that was the thing at the time I was most proud of and. We did a really good job with hype and building up interest. And I did some crazy stuff with that thing in order to like improve the performance because the performance of Android at the time was like sludge. Um, so I basically implemented my own primitive toolkit for UI rendering in order to like overcome the uh, limitations of the platform because I was so determined this was going to be the best app on Android. And I built it in like six, nine months or so. Uh, worked really closely with the designer and I like, had pretty free reign of how to build it. Like the CEO of TweetDeck was like, just make it good. I was like, okay, I'll do that. I'll do my best. Please. Yeah. So yeah, they took it away. Uh, it's probably just as well because the UI toolkit I built I ended up having poor performance on the next version of Android. So I would have had to like <laughs> go in and like tweak it continuously. That's what, this is what happened. Like, I learned from that, that, you know, if you go against the platform's suggested way of doing things, then you're doubling your work at least, but sometimes you should. Sure. But yeah. Especially, especially in a framework like, like, or in a, in a platform like iOS or Android, where everything is so, uh, tightly bundled together, um, you know, in a way that I think certainly the early versions of windows and probably Mac OS were not 
probably more so now, but um, I honestly wouldn't know because I don't, I don't, I haven't coded anything properly, at least not for a desktop. Um, I don't know, since college. So like 2003, 2004. Um, it's, you know, and, and I got as, I got as far as visual basic six or visual basic dot net, I think actually, um, with some turbo Pascal and VB six. And what else did we use before that? Yeah. I built yeah, the game as well, these, but it was like, definitely need some visual your, basic. yeah, the character, I don't think this was in turbo Pascal, but the, oh, it must, must've been the, my spaceship could spin. I don't know if I ever got it to like move across the screen, but you could at least spin it and shoot the bullets. And now if it hit, if it hit an asteroid, then the asteroid would explode. So that was incredibly, uh, uh, satisfying as you said, you know, to figure out, or at least yeah. to go through for me, go through the, the exercise and actually accomplish that with, you know, a little bit of data missing. Cause of course you gotta figure something out for yourself, but, um, yeah, it's 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 been a while. <laughs> These well, days, I'm like, I, people are like, "What is your I've, favorite programming language?" I'm like, "If it's not Python or PHP, I don't know how to read it, so I just I don't want to <laughs> see it." <laughs> that's yeah. Well, that's that's interesting. I know that you. I know how it is to have favorites for sure. But I was big into Swift for a few years because I was at Apple when they released uh, they open sourced it, and also I was big into Apple, and uh, it is a nice language. But I've yeah. Uh, form that I've loved with it for various reasons. But, you know, when you've got a favorite, you don't want to see anything in anything else. And now, like with yeah, T, yeah. Well, I'm deliberately making it so that we're using multiple languages and like that's part of the goals of what we're doing with T. But I uh, rediscovered Ruby a little bit as a result. We do a lot of TypeScript. And, uh, well, there'll be various other things. I'm certainly going to end up doing some Rust. Yeah, so let's let's... Let's transition a little bit here. Uh, you talked a little bit about homebrew. Like, what came first? Was was homebrew first, or or uh, uh, working at Apple? Did that come first? Like, how did how did that all string together? Yeah. Well, homebrew came out in two thousand nine. I was still at Last Fem, and I was leading the client team. So we did like apps because uh, Last Fem was like mostly a website, but also had a bunch of apps, and we had six apps. Uh, if you can believe it, Apple, um, Mac, Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, iPhone, and a BlackBerry app. The BlackBerry app was pretty short lived because the BlackBerry app store was so short lived. Most people don't even know that it existed. Um, yeah, uh, it's also the least <laughs> favorite of the ones we were working on. Like our favorite was, I don't know, like the, uh, the PC apps were written in a toolkit called Qt, so it's C++. Um, C++ probably put back my programming career by like five years overall. I think like, it's just so slow going, like, I'm, you know, I got good at it. I was good at it. Um, toolkits like cute, certainly are essential in order to like not shoot yourself in the foot continuously, but it's not a good language. And I'm glad that basically it's eventually disappearing gradually over time. Um, some people love it, so I'm sorry if you love it, but I don't, <laughs> I don't miss it at all. Um, yeah, so we had these six apps and like, we built everything on Mac because that was the platform where everything worked. You could run a VM for Linux and Windows, and then you could have all the Mac stuff running. And like, generally the Mac dev tools were a little bit better. So we preferred to use those. Uh, but what, what was missing was like some glue to make it so building for all these different platforms was easier. So that's where Brew came from. Brew came from me complaining a lot about how much time we were wasting, like, Man managing build systems and different builds and different open source libraries and combining everything for development and deployment. So uh, one of my coworkers like got fed up with my moaning and challenged me to do something about it. And uh, well, as my co-founder at T will tell you, uh, if I find something irritating enough and you like tell me to do something about it, like I probably will. So I did essentially. Yeah. So I started working on Homebrew too. and after a bit, I realized that it was actually better than what I thought it was even going to be. And I should open source it and see if the rest of the world liked it. Yeah, well, to cut a long story short, yeah, they did. <laughs> so 
So I quit Last Fem to work on it because it was um, like the most satisfying work I'd ever done. Like there was thousands of people like contributing to it and enjoying it and using it and uh, suggesting how it should go. This community was forming that was exciting. Um, but yeah, ran out of money pretty quick. There's no money in open source, especially then. Uh, so yeah, my career is quite literally been doing a bunch of open source until I run out of money, then finding contract work or jobs or startups, um, saving some money, working on open source a bit in my spare time. But typically when I was working, I was doing two jobs, you know, the, the job I was paid for and the job that I actually wanted to do. Yeah. So, uh, Apple came six years after, uh, I made homebrew. At this point, I wasn't working on homebrew that much anymore. Um, I burned out from the cycles. And also, it basically was doing what I wanted it to do. Like, I put all the things in it I wanted. It, it achieved the goals I had for it. So I was just on the governance board. Um, but I, I have been teaching iPhone development at Chicago boot camp, and I really enjoyed that. And uh, I did it part time so I could work on open source about half the time and I was teaching half the time and it seemed perfect, but they had to close up. So I was left without a job and I wondered what I'd do with myself. So I asked my wife at the time what I should do. And she said, why don't you reply to one of those recruitment emails that Google always send you? Um, so I did, I didn't really think I wanted to work at Google, but I thought, why not? Let's see what happens. So uh, they rushed me to interview because obviously because of homebrew, um, I remember asking the recruiter, uh, you know, I don't know any com computer science, right? You're not, you're not going to like be asking me any of that computer science questions in the interview. Cause I know they do, but right. I was like, there's no point in me doing this if that's what you're going to do. Right. The recruiter obviously didn't know what they were talking about because they said, Oh no, no, we understand. This is different. <laughs> it was not. It was like the first, <laughs> first question I got was like, the uh, inverting a binary tree question, which I'm pretty sure wasn't actually that. It was uh, just inverting some like uh, data structure. I don't think it was a binary tree. And I honestly, at this point, I can't really remember. So didn't do that well on that day of eight interviews. Uh, they, a week later, they told me they weren't gonna hire me. And that's when I wrote this viral tweet that is fairly easy to find or Google if you want, where I uh, nonchalantly uh, decried how Google uses the software I'd written, but they didn't want to hire me, uh, which I still agree with the, the sentiment of this. Um, but it, you know, it's got millions and millions of views at this point, but like for several days, it was like the topic of conversation all over the internet. Cause essentially I was like pointing like a hole in how hiring works where, right. you know, I proved myself by making the software that uh, loads of engineers at Google use and like, that's not untrue. I don't know what percentage it is. In the tweet, I said 90%. Like, you know, I had a few hundred followers when I wrote that tweet. I did not expect it to get any attention. It was just a rant, a rant. You know, I was just like complaining about just, what happened. It's just a shit post. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I feel bad about it now in the respect that it got so much attention. Uh, but what, what happened for me is that I got over 200 recruitment emails. Um, from good companies, uh, and I got one from Apple, so I couldn't say no because you know, I've been an Apple fanboy for a while. Like, I was a Linux guy, but when OS X Tiger, I think it was, came out, I bought a Mac Mini, it was one of the first Intel Macs, uh, to try it out, and I realized that it was the perfect combination of what I loved about Linux and some people who can actually design things because <laughs> like the apps on Linux right. are still, you know, there's still a mismatched bunch of uh, things. And like, if you don't object to that, then it's fine. But as, as someone who likes computers, I like to get on with the work I'd like to get on with. And like the, the lack of consistency between tooling on Linux was always mm -hmm. throwing a wrench in my ability to actually get any work done. So, I fell in love with the Mac and yeah, so I went to Apple for a year. I 100% agree with the, the Linux problem. And, and it's not that the software doesn't work or that it doesn't work well. It, it is 
almost invariably, at least what I found when it was time for me to do something, you know, productive, it was it was the UI. It was in, and sometimes the UX as well. Like the workflow just made no sense, or like where things were in the menu. I'm like, where the hell is this thing? And you look up and you're like, you look it up on Google because, you know, yeah. somebody's probably written a tutorial for this thing on on uh, um, uh, on the GIMP or something like that. Um, and you're like, why is that option in that menu? Like I would, I, clearly I never thought to look in that menu because it just doesn't belong in that menu. Um, so I'm, I run Mac as well. I've done that for a few years now. And, um, and yeah, it, it's, I mean, these days it would probably be much easier for me to switch to a Mac, except for the fact that I use Apple music and a bunch of other stuff that's Apple proprietary, but, um, or, or at least not on Linux and no yeah. web version exists, of course. But, um, course. I mean, I could, I could modify my life to, to go more open source than it is now. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely found the same issues was just like, this is, it's either super ugly, um, or hasn't been updated to the latest version of GTK or, you know, what have you, whatever, yeah. whatever UI framework was at the Red time. Did, like, did you ever insane. try something like elementary OS or Linux mint or like one of those other attempts to just make everything? more Mac-like essentially. Ele elementary looked really good, but it just seemed to be taking so long. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not just waiting around for this to get better. I need a new computer tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like I have over the years, because I'm passionate about these alternative operating systems and like open source in general. I'm a huge believer in open source, but I know the problems with open source are often leadership oriented or like, uh, a lack of commitment to getting things done. And so, yeah, things take forever. But one of the things I'd love to do once tea is done and you can build open source for a living is build my own Linux. Build my own desktop environment, at least. <laughs> Possibly my own Linux. I, I over sure. years, have had so many ideas for how a UI could be, and I just want to make the one for me, you know? I don't care if only, like, me and a thousand other people like it. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to build it. Uh, but that, you know, that's a, that's a, a pipe dream, you know, I'd love to do that, but will I ever get the chance? I, personally, I would say elementary, I just checked, I just checked because I needed to, elementary is still going. Apparently it has a founder and CEO, which I didn't realize until now. Her name is uh, Danielle Foray and they're, they're still going. Apparently they have a, they have a plan for responsive apps. I'm like, this is great. Like the app center actually looks really nice, like, or at least really decent. Um, so I, I'm, I'm generally of the opinion of like too many people want to do their own thing these days, but you know, if it's, if it's primarily Max needs this. And so Max is going to build it for himself. <laughs> you go nuts. Um, I'm not going to yeah, stop exactly. you, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so yeah. Okay. So a hope building brew, uh, which I guess became homebrew eventually led to, getting a position with Apple. You were an Xcode developer there. What I know Apple's famously secretive. And for all I know, you still have an NDA in place from your, um, from your employment contract, but I'm sure for some parts I do, but the work I did there was open sourced. <laughs> so I, can't okay. see how I was going to say, like, that. what can you also, actually like, tell us about the first person I've talked to about it? So. <laughs> sure. Sure. That, so like, what can, what can you say about life at Apple, um, that I, it wasn't, you know, wasn't and being me, part yeah. of the Xcode team wasn't for me. Um, I should, I should have known really the, the problem was like, I had, um, I had such a success with homebrew that after homebrew, it was like, what on earth am I going to do with myself now that it's going to like actually make me feel good. Um, uh, I feel like now that like, it was kind of unfortunate in a way that I had it when I was so young. Cause I was 28 when I made it. Um, so yeah, Apple one for me, like it, it, it was, you know, this, the same reasons I didn't think I should work at Google, but I don't work well with large teams and large companies. I, I like to do things quickly <laughs> as fast as possible mm -hmm. many, much of the time. So the way I worked like clashed completely with the team I was on and my manager was a new manager and he just didn't know how to work with me. He'd been at Apple like his whole professional life. The only way he knew how to work was the way everyone else at Apple worked. And um, we could not work together. And 
after like, I, I did the Swift package manager, it was a, it was a, you know, an, an obvious thing for me to do there. Um, and like, sure. it's a shame that I didn't stick with it because there's issues with it that I would have resolved over the years if I could have, but like, I also found it impossible to, to get anything done there. Like everything, every decision had to be like thrown through four teams, commit, uh, committees of, and meetings. Um, in order to have it like basically approved. So I started trying to sneak stuff in and that, <laughs> that would get me in trouble because like we hadn't gone through the process and that was just way too much process for me. But also at the same time, I could see how if you've been there 10 years that they let you sneak stuff in and you didn't have to do the process. Uh, and I was like, well, I can't uh. wait 10 years for the chance <laughs> to actually make a difference here. Uh, so I quit. Um, I feel bad about it because, like, in a way, they took a chance on me, and I just like, you know, didn't didn't, didn't deliver what they deserved. But just I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. In the end. But yeah, I've, I've been people. there before. I, I I know that feeling. Yeah. Um. Okay. And so your time at Apple ended. Um. You know, eventually you went on to start off. T. What's T? Uh. I. I you. You know. You mentioned earlier you're trying to solve this problem of open source development, basically, you know, not having uh, any sort of wage, you know, a lot of people doing it for the passion and, and that's great for a little while, but like you said, you lose commitment for a variety of reasons. Can you tell, tell us a little bit more about T and what you're, uh, how you're trying to solve those problems? Yeah, well, solving open source compensation has been something that I've been interested in for a long time with obvious reasons, because I kept taking jobs that uh, I, I pick stuff I liked generally. But a lot of the time I was sitting there thinking, I don't want to be doing this. I want to be working on this open source project. Uh, I've, you know, I've made dozens, like my GitHub's littered with unsuccessful attempts and successful attempts. Homebrew obviously is the one that I'm most well known for. Um, but you know, like the, there's this other one I wrote, Promise Kit, which was this promises library for iOS. And uh, it was pretty successful. A hundred thousand apps used it at one point. And so one day I realized that I got 100,000 apps using this library. If all of them gave me a dollar a year, then I could afford to work on it full time. Uh, it's not a great developer salary, but it's a start. Now, if I had like three projects sure. that did that, then uh, even Netflix couldn't offer me uh, more money, right? So <laughs> uh, it was like, yeah, so how do I get everyone using Promise Kit to give me $1 a year? Like, even if your app is a free app, like a dollar a year is not an unreasonable amount of our money to ask for for something you find essential. And it was a good library. It's not sure, yeah. necessary anymore. Uh, but I still maintain it. Not as much as I should, but, you know, <laughs> I'm going to make a living, it's the truth. So that's something I've been interested in for a while. And also, like, the idea of what a brew 2 might be. Like, I left the project... Uh, but as I left the project, I started a notes uh, page in my notes app. And over the years, I filled it with ideas for what a package manager could be. Um, what can it do? What is What can something like that do, which nobody has really tried before? Because doing new things is what interests me. Um, so last year, I was looking through my notes for ideas for things to work on. And my friend, Timothy Lewis, who I've known for like 10 years, I met him in Chicago. And like this guy, um, always, you always end up finding interesting things to work on or people to meet or things that are going on. So I've kept in contact with him. And he got into crypto um, years ago. And he's been trying to get me into it for years. And so every year he'd like say, hey, Max, if you did like digital contracts, you could be only $500 an hour. And um yeah, I was like, $500 an hour, that's not bad. It's like 2016 or whatever. <laughs> but the truth is, like, I didn't see what was interesting about crypto. And I think like this is what happens with a lot of people uh, who like in more traditional Web2 type stuff right now. It's like, what's interesting about money? Apart from like accumulating it. But like, how am I going to get up in... The, like, otherwise, I've already gone into finance, right? Like some of my friends who went into finance and their lives are like miserable things. With, yeah, I'm sure some people enjoy it. Um, but he kept, he kept on about it 
about like the last time he called me, I was looking through my notes for Brew 2, and I just had this like moment of understanding one evening when I was experimenting with like some of the Web3 stuff. Like calling it Web3 was genius, incidentally, like whoever did that, because like then it wasn't crypto. Then it was like, oh, so we're saying this is like the next web. And that's a you know, a grand statement, right? But it's a grand statement that it needs is. some exploration. You have to have a look mm. and be like, okay, why is this the next web? So as I dove into the rabbit hole, I started to see what was special about it. But I had this moment of inspiration where I saw how digital contracts allow like uh, vastly larger scales of automated payments at much smaller like cost. And uh, I had this like moment of inspiration where I saw that the open source ecosystem represented by a package manager where we could trickle down little bits of uh, token as they enter the system into the entire stack, all the way from uh, like the, the top uh, level, like node um, React component that someone's made all the way down to libc, uh, just by like right. using a digital contract to transfer this money, little bits, little bits to all the dependencies. And so I found out Tim and I was like, can we do something with this? And so we started the company, we found some investment. Like we've, uh, well, we're, we're in the middle of another round, but we've currently raised eight and a half uh, publicly. A uh, million days, obviously. And um, so we've been <laughs> yes. operating about Eight and a half year. dollars is not going to get you very far. <laughs> um, operating about a year. And like I'm gearing up to release what is the, the command line tool, the, the package manager, um, before okay. the end of the year. And so this, like, we're, we're approaching the whole thing with two, two sort of main um, attack points, like building like a suite of packaging tools for all developers, and then basing the package registry on blockchain. So we have uh, the capacity for token to flow through it. Also, you get the benefits of blockchain, like it's an immutable registry. Uh, open source yeah. releases should be immutable and not suddenly vanish or change underneath of you. Like, you know, the, the open source ecosystem like operates on a huge amount of trust that is becoming increasingly probably not a good idea. Let's face it. There's too many packages out there. Yeah. Every couple of months we read about some story of someone trying to get something malicious in there. And, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we got the entire internet basically dependent on an open source stack that the security verification of that is not great. So we're coming at it with the attitude that we're going to fix that at the same time with decentralization, immutability, and a blockchain model where package maintainers themselves register their releases into this blockchain. And then we use those registrations that effectively they're NFTs, but without the JPEGs, like the, the proper NFT, which is just a non an immutable data point, essentially. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's just a, can a I get a JPEG data. though? <laughs> Like, you know, uh, my co-founder kind of wants to put JPEGs on them as well, but I, it's not necessary. <laughs> you know, this isn't like sure. um, no, no. NFTs, like the board nice or any of the other stuff. Uh, this is like a good use no, of that's, technology. It's, um, yeah, and actually, I would say, once again, going back to the, do you really need to build something new? Um, Git PO app is actually really good for, for this type of thing, where, you know, mm -hmm. if you're you're the official uh, uh, deployer or like the first person who's actually built this thing and you deploy it, et cetera. Um, you know, you can get a PO app attached to that GitHub repo and probably other things, um, you know, with yeah. some modification yep. to show that Maybe you are actually the person who, who owns this package. Perfect. There you go. See, <laughs> great minds. Yeah, we, we like what they're doing and I uh, can certainly see some collaboration there as we, as we move forwards. But yeah, essentially our plan is to, make open source something that you can work on. Like I use mm -hmm. myself as an example, obviously. Um, I've wanted to work on open source since I quit chemistry. That's all I've wanted to do, but I haven't been able to. And in the time I've worked on open source, I've made numerous projects that have made the world a better place, that are useful to development, have advanced the art of software engineering. If I had been able to work on that full time, what else would I have been able to make? It's the truth of it. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. a lot of people who work in open source or do open source would rather be doing that full time. They're passionate about these things. They want the opportunity. And it's our intention to make it so that they can. They don't have to find other jobs. 
but I also want like all these engineers at Facebook, Google, and Microsoft who are like super talented to quit and work on open source full time. <laughs> They're incredibly talented people who work at these places and they shouldn't be spending their, they shouldn't be using their intelligence for, you know, making ads more viral or like gamifying <laughs> likes and things like that. Like this is just a nonsense use of like these incredibly talented engineers. So yeah. with T, our goal is to make it so that there is a viable way to work on open source. Uh, and make as much money as you could make working at a fan company without having to deal with all yeah. that stuff. Or, or at least, an, I mean, getting, you know, getting to a position where you could leave Google making $200,000 a year and with, you know, a little bit of sweat equity, uh, obviously, you know, putting, putting the time and effort into it, get back to that level. I think that's great. But I think there's a lot of people who would just be satisfied being comfortable and having mm -hmm. obviously especially pre-COVID, a little bit more flexibility in where they do that work and what kind of lifestyle they want. Um, you know, 60K goes a long way still in lots of parts of the world or, or you know, even 100K still yeah, goes, you know, goes much further in, I don't know, the, the Andalusian countryside than it does in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, if you can move to uh, a nice part of Spain or... Czech Republic or, or Costa Rica or something like that, and be able to afford a good life there, not having to worry about spending $2 million on a two bedroom apartment. Uh, you know, I think the, the, you're good, you're in good shape still there as well. So I'm just thinking like back to like my own experience, cause I do work at the command line every once in a while. I'm a, I'm a trained sysadmin. Um, something like, I guess, pip for Python, right? Pip install this library, you know, because you need it as part of the, the, the Python thing that you're like, I'm in the middle of deploying MK docs for this project I'm working on. Um, like for, from a practical perspective, that's where that would be. Right. So the people who are making MK docs, even though it's, uh, open source, you know, as I'm using it as my project and hopefully my, my thing is super successful. I'm paying them for the privilege of, the, of using this stuff that they've put out for free. Right. Well, that's, that's no. Funnily enough, no, okay. everyone assumes that. So, you know, like, if I, like this, this project would not succeed if I changed how open source works. Uh, open source sure. is free. It has to remain free. So, um, you know, another thing that really you can only do with blockchain is like indirect payment models, essentially. So uh, if you read our white paper, like we have white paper because every crypto project has to have a white paper. Um, but, I, I, you know, I... I I poo poo it a little bit, but like, honestly, it really helped us like solidify our thoughts on how it's going to work. So take it back to a certain extent, but, uh, essentially we're using a proof of stake blockchain, uh, and you know, for two reasons, okay. one, you can't really do a proof of work one anymore without everyone giving you a hard time. And you know, some of those objections are reasonable. It does use a lot of energy, but not nearly as much yeah. as all the tumble dryers in the world or the air conditioners or anything, but yeah, well, never mind. Um, so proof of stake, but also because we want to uh, use the proof of stake model to allow people who are staking to stake against open source packages. So you stake oh. against like the packages you use. So you won't have to like pay a micro payment every time you install something with pip. But what you will do is you'll buy a certain amount of T token and stake that against all the dependencies that you or your app or your team or just the just uh, the ones you yeah. like use. So you know, put fifty bucks in, put a hundred bucks in. So you're going to spend a hundred bucks a year uh, and stake it against the open source you actually use. And then, because it's proof of stake, every time there's an epoch, we generate some new token and we distribute that into the the graph based on what you've staked. So if you stake, uh, what was it, MK? What were you saying? What was the MK package? docs? MK docs. You stake against that. MK Docs gets, uh, let's say 90% of the stake reward. Um, we haven't figured out the exact percentages yet. 10% will then go to the dependencies of MK Docs. And then 10% from each of those will keep going down the tree. So the further down the tree art you are, the more indirect compensation you're getting, but it's smaller and smaller amounts. So it will equal out quite well. Like when you become like a mm -hmm. big dependency, you're going to just have stuff coming at you all the time and like it will be worth a fair amount. We'll probably have certain limitations in place. 
Uh, otherwise, open SSL would get so much it would be ridiculous. <laughs> we're trying to figure out the math. Like we're writing what we call the yellow yeah, yeah. paper now, which is where we define precise numbers on how we're going to go about this. Although, of course, we can always tweak it down the road. Like one of the wonderful of things about Web three is like this idea of DAOs, where you you build a bunch of digital contracts and you allow voting to actually influence how it all works. Like you know, in a way that you don't have to involve a lawyer. Just works. <laughs> Like if you don't anticipate yeah. enough stuff up front, then it can collapse. And you've seen examples of that in Web3. Like the last, you know, five years are full of uh, companies or projects that have spun up, haven't got the digital contracts right, and then ended up in like a, a situation where they're just stuck. Uh, there was one project I heard about yeah. recently where they needed a vote to change how some f of the governments worked in order to have votes work, and they didn't get enough people voting. So now it's, it's just stuck. They can't, they can't change anything. You can't rewrite the digital contract. Um, the project's dead unless they can persuade enough yeah. people to uh, form a consensus. Exactly. So you've got to do these things right. But yeah, you know, yeah. You could... so we'd have a DAO and uh, initially us at T would have a large voting block of that. But over time, we want it to be so that we don't have a large voting block. So we'll build it in. You'll be able to see it in the digital contracts, how our voting is going to go down. Because we just want to make sure we're guiding it at first. And then after a while, mm -hmm. the T blockchain is a completely independent entity. Like we have a company, but we don't want to control this blockchain. We want the open source community to control it. So packages in our blockchain that have more, they're more of a dependency. So the more of a dependency you are, the more important you are. And the more voting uh, right you will then have. Uh, so yeah. So you're launching your own blockchain, but I guess most of this is predicated on that staking thing of like having, I was just looking at the, um, I've got the white paper open. So I was just looking at the, uh, the diagram here for the, for the package manager. Like that's, I guess, primarily it, it's about the, the decentralized registry, uh, the package maintainer, getting that creator NFT through the T blockchain, submitting the package, et cetera. And then that rewards engine that you're just talking about. So all these, mm -hmm. uh, uh, projects that have said like, yeah, I want to stake again, you know, $50 against what was that one a few years ago that NPM left, I think it was called the <laughs> package a few years ago that suddenly went left away pad. and like thousands, yeah. yes, left pad. Mm -hmm. And then th thousands of websites are like, they're borked. They don't work. Yeah. Um, We're something deep. like NPM uh... left pad, there would be an incentive to keep keep the package there um in in, in yeah PM's well package not, not only would they be incentivized in to keep well. it there but I, you know the left pad story is quite interesting um part of the reason he pulled the stuff was because he was fed up with maintaining these things thanklessly we call this the nebraska problem based on that xkcd comic which is called dependency and it's the stack of blocks representing all digital infrastructure and right at the bottom, there's this little pillar that's precariously holding the whole thing up. And it has a little arrow saying, maintained by some person in Nebraska since 2003. Thanklessly maintained. And, you know, you know um, <laughs> recently there was open yeah. uh, Log4j uh, in December, I, I believe. Yes. And a massive yeah. exploit. And nobody knew they were using this thing. It was deep in the stack. And so we're going to make it so maintaining these things is rewarded. Like Log4j might not have had this security exploit if T token was flowing to them. And this is like a great thing that we're going to be able to do is um, we're going to punish you if your open source has security problems in it or other major breaking bugs, like breaking semantic versioning, for example. Uh, like our objective is to make the open source ecosystem more robust and more secure as well as funded. Like funding it makes sense from that perspective. Like the incentive for the people who maintain this stuff can't just be they feel bad if they don't, which honestly for a lot of my open source is has been my incentive. I feel bad if I don't. Yeah. So, yeah, I was, I was going to about, I won't. <laughs> okay i, I was I mean, gonna i, I guess, was gonna tell like, a story but i don't think i have the right okay okay that's fine um i was going to contrast this with the i think the the previous large attempt due to this which was that red hat oracle uh uh you know ibm etc 
basically just started paying people to to do the work you know themselves and like and that's great for a little while but those companies well maybe red hat the exception because obviously they're selling support for enterprise linux and all that but like ibm oracle especially at some point the shareholders come in and are like so where's the benefit of paying you know a thousand people or two thousand yeah. people to focus yeah, well, solely free, right? on on open source yeah and, and are not working for free because it i imagine at least part of the incentive was that ibm relies on on those libraries or oracle does and so somebody needs to maintain them but i think you know especially when it's a publicly funded company or even when it's a privately funded one or owned one you know the, the rubber has to meet the road at some point somebody needs to justify etc and and then you have end up being in you know pretty much the same position of like well, how do we justify maintaining all this stuff if we're the only ones using it or only, only a few people use them then why are the open source and why are we spending millions of dollars a year on people who are working you know on stuff that anybody can use and we're not getting you know while we might yeah. be using this software we're the we're not getting any kickback for it even like i have to imagine ibm probably would have seen this as a, a terrific um part of the revenue model or at least a small one you know to help make that group of people um more financially sustainable um and i'm not advocating for them to just move everybody over to t but maybe it would be better if they did i don't know um you know that's something that i'm sure well, you could talk indeed. to them about and and that they can figure out for themselves um cool uh we've we've come up to time um but i'm i'm really excited about what you're doing with t and and you know the problems you're you're trying to solve here um are there any like before we wrap up are there any other potential like side benefits to to having all this in place or um you know maybe, maybe or maybe even some unforeseen circumstances that you guys are you know have just realized might come up and are trying to deal with before the launch well um one thing i've realized while working on this is um we're effectively incentivizing some competition in open source as well um because like open SSL is my example, uh, it's at the root of a huge number of package uh, graphs. And, uh, you know, it hasn't had like some people have tried to make alternatives, but it it's the security of the whole internet essentially is open SSL. And it, it's had a lot of yeah. bugs. Uh, with yeah. T, people will be able to see how much token open SSL is getting. And they could make a competitor invest in that. And then get projects to switch. So they'll say, hey, look, our version is more secure. We've proved it. We've written in Rust. We've done a static analysis. It's a, the API is exactly the same because mm -hmm. they want to make it as easy as possible for people to switch. Your project uses OpenSSL switch to us and they could even write a digital contract so they give a kickback to the project that switched. Like a small percentage of what they're getting goes back to that project. Like, you know, you can do interesting things. So I think you know, hopefully we're going to improve the robustness and security of the whole internet via that mechanism, just like making it so there's a little bit of capitalism in there, a little bit of an incentive. Mm -hmm. well, the most interesting thing about <laughs> Web3 for me is these incentive systems. Like that's, that's what I learned while going through it, like how it's all based like on game theory, essentially. And like that, that makes it interesting to learn. But otherwise, uh, go to t.xyz and authenticate with T. It just signs you in with your GitHub account. We do an analysis of uh, all the open source you've ever worked on. And there may or may not be an airdrop associated with that at some point. So go and do that. Ooh, there's, a, there's a little bit of alpha being leaked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, the, the last question I wanted to ask was like how... Like what does the BD side of things look like? Like do you have somebody approaching some of these... Uh, uh, package, you know, like package maintainers to make sure that they at least know about T and are and are authenticating uh, now and stuff like that. Or is it just put the word out there and and hope they come? So I'm doing it like an open source project. So I'm going to release something which is uh, complete enough that people understand why it exists, but not complete enough so they don't see how they can contribute to it. And uh, okay. You know, I'll, I'll hope it I'll hope it has the same ascent as Brew, essentially, uh, where it, it, people see that this is a useful tool. Like it, it literally, it contains all the ideas I've had since Brew for what a package manager can be, 
Um, I think that at this position in the development stack, there's huge opportunity that nobody's re ever really experimented with. Like you literally control everything that a developer uses. And most package managers, all they do is update and install this stuff. That's all Brew did, really. Uh, like initially, it was meant to do more, and it kind of still does a bunch of stuff that's different. But part the, the reason it was so successful was um, really the, the virality of the contribution model I went with, I think, with hindsight. I uh, made it so trivial for people to get involved and, and so interesting for them to do so. Uh, T will have the same tricks. Uh, it won't work as well the second time, so I got some others on the on the on the bandwagon <laughs> too there. Um, but yeah, so like initially we'll just see how that goes. But obviously I got a, a reasonably large amount of money behind this company, and we will be uh, <laughs> spending it to try and get the right people interested. And uh, I will be more actively reaching out to relevant open source projects uh, to get them involved and interested. And we'll be, you know, assisting with that process as well. Like it's, it's really different when you have like commercial open source. So I've got some money behind the company. I can put development on it without having to like wait for people to turn up and volunteer. And so we can really make a, a great effort at doing what's necessary to make sure that this is something that helps the open source ecosystem and is useful to all developers. Now, this isn't just about open source as far as I'm concerned. This is a tool that I need as someone who likes to build apps. And uh, mm -hmm. everyone who does development should find a, a good amount of utility out of T. That's the goal. Yeah. So. And, and you're hiring. you got a few job openings there. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to get involved full time, since you have some money behind it, <laughs> they can head to the website and check it out. Uh, I already know where to go, so I'll just tell people. So t.xyz or xyz, if you speak yeah. that version yeah. of English, like you and I. And um, yeah, and if the people want to follow you on on Twitter, it's uh, twitter.com slash mxcl. Uh, Max, thanks a lot for your time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck to you with T and the launch. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Derek. Uh, for everybody listening or watching, until next time, stay free. <laughs>